Okay, the next one is a really important topic for our course, and that is biologically important nutrients. Biologically important nutrients are those nutrients that are required by photosynthetic organisms in the ocean, our friends, the phytoplankton. They're also required by things like seaweeds and marine plants, but the phytoplankton being the most abundant and numerous organisms in the ocean, those are the ones we concentrate on for the most part. Biologically important nutrients are trace elements. They're minor constituents, but they're important because they're needed for the growth of phytoplankton. And of course, as we already know, phytoplankton provide the air we breathe, they moderate our climate, and they provide food for marine food webs. Well, the biologically important nutrients aren't much different from what you might find in a box of miracle grow. If you read the side of the box, you'll see three numbers. In this case, 18 to 18 to 21. Those three numbers refer to three elements, nitrogen, N, phosphorus, P, and potassium, K. Nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium make up what are called macronutrients, or the nutrients that are acquired in the highest quantities by phytoplankton and terrestrial plants as well. Those three elements, N, P, and K, are the bulk of what's required by plants for growth. So if they don't have enough nitrogen, which is most commonly found in the form of a substance called nitrate, then they're not going to grow. If they're lacking in phosphorus, they're not going to grow. If they're lacking in potassium, they're not going to grow. So those elements, those macronutrients, are vital to the growth of plants. Some nutrients are required in lesser quantities. Things such as silica and iron. And as it turns out, some of the organisms we're already familiar with have important micronutrient requirements. Things like the diatoms that we looked at in ocean sediments. Diatoms have a cell wall made up of what? That's right, silica. They form the siliceous oozes, oozes that we find at the bottom of the ocean. So their requirement for silica means that they have to find it dissolved in seawater. And if it's lacking in seawater, then they don't grow. Those diatoms just hang out and can't grow and divide uh, and just wait until mixing or some other process brings those nutrients in. Other important phytoplankton, like the cyanobacteria, which we'll talk about when we get to chapter 13, they don't need silica. So some organisms have very specific requirements, in this case diatoms needing silica, cyanobacteria not, so when certain elements are available, certain species will grow. When those elements aren't available, those species won't grow. So just like you see the variety of plants around your home that have different kinds of requirements for different kinds of fertilizers, and just like you find on the sides of different kinds of fertilizers, different N to P to K ratios, in this case, this one's good for tomatoes, those specific macronutrient and even trace element requirements are specific to a particular kind of plant and phytoplankton work the same way. It'd be a good idea to go take a look at your local nursery or garden store and kind of hang out and check out the plants and check out the different kinds of fertilizers to really get an idea of how phytoplankton work in the ocean and the importance of nutrients for phytoplankton in the ocean. Okay. One important principle that comes out of our study of biologically important nutrients is something called the law of the minimum. It's stated in this way, that nutrient that is needed by a particular organism, the one that's in the least supply is the one that's going to limit the growth of the plant. For example, let's just say that we starve our tomato plants. We're cruel gardeners and we don't want our tomato plants to grow. Well, we remove their nutrients. But if it turns out that they need nitrogen more than anything else, in this case in the form of nitrate, that would be the limiting nutrient. Nitrate, that substance needed by the organism, but available in the least amount, we call the limiting factor. That factor, that one element, in this case, that limits the growth of the plant. And this was put together by what his teachers described as a useless student a fellow named Justin von Liebig, a German chemist who went on to develop really the most important principle of our time for agriculture, mostly, 
And agriculture um, farmers and those and agricultural scientists apply the law of the minimum to understand how to maximize the benefit of fertilization. And it applies to the ocean as well because the element that's not available that's limiting the growth of the phytoplankton we call the limiting factor or the limiting nutrient. In figure 6.3, we have a, an illustration that's meant to kind of, by way of analogy, help you understand the concept of a limiting factor. If we envision each plank of a wooden bucket, and I doubt that any of you have ever seen any of these because I don't even know if they make these kind of buckets anymore, but if you have heard of one or if you know where I can find one, let me know because I'd like to get one and make my own little bucket like this. But the shortest plank, in this case it would be nitrogen or nitrate, is the one that determines how much water the bucket can hold. And in an analogous way, the element or the nutrient that's in the least supply, again, the one that's in the lowest concentration, is the one that limits the growth of the particular phytoplankton species. So it might be nitrogen, it could be other things, and in many cases, as we'll learn later on, it's iron. And there's a really big push right now to understand iron limitation in the ocean because throwing iron out into the ocean and causing blooms of phytoplankton has been proposed as a way of solving global warming, or at least part of the global warming crisis. So take a look at this figure. Uh, it might take a couple looks, but I think you can understand that the shortest plank in a bucket is the one that's going to determine how much water the bucket can hold. And in an analogous way, the nutrient that's in the least supply is the one that's going to limit the phytoplankton growth. I hope you understand that because it's an important principle and we'll return to it in chapter 13. Well, here's another illustration. This is, is figure 613 that kind of puts all of this together. We can see that nitrogen and phosphorus really turn out to be the most important factors uh, controlling how much phytoplankton, and here's a couple examples of phytoplankton, the diatoms that we saw uh, in last week's lecture, and we haven't visited dinoflagellates yet. They have a cool name because they're part dinosaur, or at least they look like little dinosaurs, and they actually are the ones that make red tides and bioluminescence and all those kinds of things, so we'll talk about them a little bit later on, but Diatoms and dinoflagellates are examples of uh, major or large phytoplankton, and they need nitrogen, and they need phosphorus. As it turns out, also cyanobacteria, which we haven't put in this figure here, also require nitrogen and phosphorus. So all the plant life, and I use that word very liberally because phytoplankton, diatoms, and dinoflagellates are not plants. They're microbes, and they photosynthesize, but that doesn't make them a plant, they all require these important macronutrients. As well, certain things like iron, and you should get familiar with Fe standing for iron, it's short for ferrous or ferric, and that's where iron comes from, and Si for silica, and we've already talked about the importance of silica to diatoms, but it's important to other things as well. These micronutrients are important for the growth of specific species or certain species. Okay, so take a short look at this figure and this kind of puts together the concept of limiting factors and the idea of nutrients and their importance in the world ocean. And these are certainly topics we're gonna to return to as we talk about productivity of the ocean and really as we begin to understand the carbon cycle and understand global warming in the ocean as well.